Good morning. 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 Good morning. Holly, when the time comes, I'll need to be a presenter. Okay, well, we'll get started in just a second. It's 10.02. I'll, we'll give people a minute or two to settle in. I'm gonna pin folks to the board while we wait, so. Morning, Jane. Morning, Council President. All right. Well, we have um, items to cover here today, so I think we will uh, get started if uh, Ms. Houston is ready and Ms. Maloney, um, and we will call our organizational committee, our org committee for short, to order. Um, good morning, friends. It is our first is this our first art committee of the year? I think it is. Um, <laughs> and so begins our um, you know, annual foray into um, our budget process, our policy process. Um, and, and also um, this org committee is our opportunity to um, look inward and check in on what our council is doing um, you know, in terms of defining our priorities and in terms of our, our our council work plan, as well as to get reports from colleagues on on the boards and commissions on which we serve. I think we noticed a few years ago that we are spread across the, the city, across the metro, and sometimes across the state, um, representing the city and getting valuable information. And then it just stayed with it, each council member. And so this is an opportunity to share what you're hearing um, on our important um, big work projects, as well as just the committees and commissions that we are um, representing the city on. So um, a great chance for us to touch base. Um, we have so three basic items on our agenda today. Um, we will first talk about um, our proposed uh, update on the council policy sessions. Um, and our org and informational meetings in 2021. We will talk quickly, um, assuming Ms. Jalali joins us, um, about the Community Organization Partnership Program, or COP. Um, I never can remember what that acronym stands for, so now you have it. And then finally, an update on committees and boards and activities. Um, and I don't, this isn't, I think that this isn't exactly um, 
I think this fits into section number one, but I think we I want to start off by rolling things over to Trudy, um, who has news to share, and I think it impacts um, our item number one. So can, uh, without ado, can I turn things over to you, Trudy? Sure, just a, a simple announcement that I just wanted to let you all know that um, I'm going to retire at the end of the year. So we have a lot of work ahead of us this year, but... Uh, um, this will be my last year with the council and we'll get it all set for the new director. This is incredible um, news, um, Ms. Maloney. You have been with the city for, with the city of St. Paul for what, for 17 years? Is that uh, correct? Yes, since 2004. Since 2004 in our council and prior to that with Minneapolis. Um, so a huge uh, career of service, especially to the cities and municipalities. And um, I talked to our friend Kathy Lantry the other day, and she said the only thing she wished she would have done is retired sooner um, because she's so enjoying, um, you know, her grandchildren, her cooking, all the things that she loves to do. I think she would love to travel more, but she, um, I know that retirement seems like a big thing I'm looking forward but I think when you people I talk to looking backwards are always so delighted um to have worked and then now take that that um that time off that they deserve so I just want to we'll have plenty of opportunities over the course of the year but I do want to say congratulations um on this announcement um it's a big deal and to your point it's a lot of work in front of us you have big f shoes to fill um and I just uh, I appreciate that you are uh, letting us know early enough where we can make up a plan and hopefully um, you will be able to impart some of your institutional knowledge on our incoming directors. So um, so much gratitude to you, Trudy, and thanks for, for this information. Congratulations. Thank you. A big deal. It's a big deal. Woo. Um, so, so with that kind of bombshell, and I know um, Ms. Maloney shared that with uh, uh, council staff, but I wanted to make sure that she shared with us um, formally because it is a really big deal. Um, we will talk a bit about our proposed policy sessions, organizational and information meetings in 2021, knowing that um, overlaying this work is our a search um, and transition to a new director, which will be um, which will be hands on for all seven of us. Um, so. Um, I do want to say I'm going to turn this first section over to um, Ms. Houston, but just want to start by um, reminding council members that we have started, I think that throughout, I mean, I only know about the time on the council since I've been here, but um, council members have always identified their priorities. I think in recent years, what we've tried to do is identify what our shared priorities are um, to help give our staff some direction on where they should be prioritizing um, their time and energy we have. Um, the capacity in our council offices to do really anything that we want to do. We can ask the questions we want to ask. Um, we can uh, pursue um, policies and, um, and, you know, and other initiatives of our choosing. Um, but it is helpful, I think, for staff and for us to identify where we are aligned um, or mostly aligned um, and moving um, a big policy agenda pieces forward. So we've tried to do that in a transparent and a public way, um, identify what our work what our work policy or work plan and policy priorities are. And I think in doing so, we're able to identify our priorities for the mayor's office um, and with the intention to hear um, those priorities and values reflected when we hear the budget. Um, we felt in the past we were sort of on the defensive. We waited until we heard the budget and then we had to fight for our priorities. And it seems smarter to identify our priorities early, make it clear to the administration and to our community what our priorities are. And then um, as we get to the budget to expect to see those priorities reflected therein. So um, this process we've been using for at least a handful of years and last year was um, uh, a clunky version of it, but I think fairly successful. And um, hopefully that we will uh, be doing the same thing. But just a reminder that um, we're by no means hemming people into what's on our you know, shared priority list. The sky's the limit, but these are just um, kind of what we've um, been able to determine throughout the course of the year. So I'm gonna turn things over to Holly for an update and recognizing that we're still kind of a work in progress. But um, if we can get a check in today and um, let us know where we're at, that would be great. Good morning, council members. Thank you, Council President Brenmon. Um, yes, so um, this meeting kicks off uh, the organizational 
committee meetings that the city council gets to talk about the work they're doing. And so these are scheduled for the first of each month. And um, part of that agenda is we have some standing agenda items. And on that is going to be an update on how the policy sessions and work plan is going. I think it's a good opportunity uh, to use this time just to check in to make sure things are moving forward. Um, and so last on December 16th, right before the end of the year, uh, a draft work plan was presented to the council and council member provided valuable feedback to make sure that list was complete with their initial priorities. Um, since that meeting, I've been meeting with key stakeholders, um, identifying what key questions need to be asked um, and what are the desired outcomes of these different sessions, as well as prioritizing the meetings and working on a schedule. Um, uh, that is not something I'm ready to present right at this moment, but in the next coming weeks, I will be sharing with council members an updated document where we can then discuss um, the plan. And there will also be um, an ask for some additional assistance for council member for council members or council member aides to just help share and shape some of the policy sessions so that we can make sure everything that is important to the council member. Um, is included in the presentation and that we get to all the major points. So that is the update I have at this point. Um, we do have a few things scheduled um, and I've been working with council members uh, executive assistants to make sure those are on the schedule. Um, thank you Holly and and I will just add that of course um, this is what Holly is working on is a snapshot in time right now and over you know, any given week or any given month, our priorities may change, they may shift, um, and that is perfectly fine. We're, we just, we need to do, have something that we're working off of. And so, um, again, I don't want people to feel, when Holly makes her rounds, I don't want people to feel hemmed in um, and that they can't add anything. Or even, you know, sometimes we've had to remove things from our priorities just because um, we can, like I said earlier, we can do anything, but we actually can't do everything. There's just not enough capacity to do all the things that we want to do in a given year. So um, sometimes we may have to say, gosh, we're going to have to push this off till next year, or we, you know, we don't have as much bandwidth to do this because this has become a higher priority. And that's part of um, our work plan, which is a living document. Um, Ms. Prince. Thank you, Council President Brenmon. And I know this is not the time to be coming up with topics. But one thing I did want to mention um, as I'm coming up with a topic um, is that um, I think all of our offices in one way or another are engaged in conversations with each other or with the administration or with the planning division on this whole area of tiny homes. And, um, and it did dawn on me that there's no better opportunity to bring all those conversations together than in an org meeting. Um, I also think what you know what we've all discovered is it's a huge topic um, because we're talking about portables, we're talking about um, you know villages and warehouses as Minneapolis is doing. We're also talking about tiny homes that you know may be kind of a market rate. Um, activity for people who want to downsize, simplify their lives and and live on, say, a few units on a single family lot. We already have ADUs, which allow that to a lesser extent. But in any event, I would um, I'd like to, while we're all together, just say that I think it would be great if sooner than later we could kind of consolidate all of our d discussions into a, a policy session. So. So thanks for indulging me in that. Uh, Ms. Prince, I so appreciate your bringing that up. I think sometimes um, advocates sort of do the divide and conquer method with council members and work um, seven different angles on the same topic. And we, when we care about something, we all start working on it. And meanwhile, six others of us are working on it in other directions. And I think that is exactly the reason why we do this. Um, so we can come together and identify those places where we're all, you know, where we are all committed and working on things and in a way minimize the amount of work, not only for ourselves, but for our staff and then also for um, city staff who are answering your question and my question and Ms. Yang's question. And um, so we will, I know that, um, I mean, I know that the 
the Department of Safety and Inspections is struggling with um, state statutes that it enforces. And um, we are going to, I believe Ms. Naker is bringing forward an amendment when uh, the legislative agenda comes back to us that includes the the efforts um, that Settled is, is working on with other tiny home advocates. But it would be good to understand what is a barrier um, and what sort of um, uh, workarounds are out there. I mean, I definitely understand the challenge of saying um, temporary structures uh, aren't homes per se um, without plumbing um, and without some safety nets and safeguards. But on the other hand, um, those of us who've toured the settled um, demonstration and other places know that there there are ways to make these safe and ways to make it go forward. So I think understanding um, where we can work around the challenges we have at the state legislature and what initiatives we're taking and what the timeline looks like would be really helpful. And and um, and I do think it it is important. Um, I mean, this is the perfect venue to on those shared on those shared initiatives to just get a check in because it it could turn out we're doing everything that we can and we just need to communicate that back. Um, in a uniform way. So I really appreciate that. And I 100% agree we will get that on the schedule. Um, and if I could just add um, to that point, I, I do think it's really important. I'm glad to hear that you're looking at potential legislation because while I appreciate that our, our DSI staff may say, you know, under the current set of circumstances, so on and so on, we can't do this. I believe that um, this is such an urgent housing need in our cities and state that um, I believe that we should seek those kinds of legislative changes or changes to the state building code if that's required. I don't think we can be satisfied in this environment to take no for an answer from our staff. Yeah. No, nope, I agree. And also, I just think that sometimes it's helpful when we do hear from staff, like what are the challenges and what, I mean, we sometimes our good intentions can open up a Pandora's box. We had no idea we were opening. So it's like, good idea to know that. What are we, how are the stop gaps there? But um, fully agree. And I do say, or I do agree that um, timeliness is key here um, with the, um, the unsheltered homeless issue is in the crisis that it is at the moment. So um, I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Houston, did you want to at least like there's, did you want to just say you had kind of summarized where you think like the five topics of like that you're um, most fleshed out right now, or do you want to hold on that until you're done with the whole document? Um, Council Bre President Bren Moen, um, I guess, um, I guess I'd like to hold off unless you feel like those are the right <laughs> areas. Um, it's fine. I guess I can, I can summarize them quick. So um, I guess within the, well, we had a long list of um, policy sessions. So those are the, poli the sessions where we hope to affect uh, a change, either program policy, an ordinance change, a budget change. Um, these would be sessions that um, we are really digging into and take some time. Then there's a series of just updates and important information that council members need to be aware of so that they can um, make sure things are moving forward and uh, doing their job and making sure that investments we've made in the budget um, are producing the outcomes that we wanted. Um, and so taking that huge list, what I'm, what I'm working on is just really identifying what are the council priorities? And then within those priorities, uh, there would be all the updates and policy sessions that fall underneath them. So um, I believe the first priority is just a sustainable street infrastructure plan. So we've talked about how do we invest more in our streets? Um, it's been a flat amount for years um, and we're not getting we're not getting the same amount of work done that we used two years ago with the same amount of money. So um, also reducing gun violence, affordable housing and stable neighborhoods, and just resp responsible fiscal policy. So that would be things like looking at the EAB program and how do we complete that program um, in a fiscally responsible way. 
So that's just really high level. <laughs> I appreciate that. And also the clarification that um, when we are collecting people's, um, you know, the questions that they asked or priorities that they identified during the year, that some things really just require an email or a memo or a quick report in versus a policy session where we do more of the digging in. And um, I think that that work to kind of identify doesn't mean we're not following up on certain things, but it may mean that we don't need to dedicate a two hour or, you know, a several series session to a, a topic at hand. And so some of those policy sessions are even going to be more than one meeting. Um, so thank you for that summary. Um, Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. I, I just wanted to say, I know we're not looking at the document in front of us, but I the drafts that I've seen, I really like the way that this is evolving. Um, I think we're taking on new issues, like as Council Member Prince said, tiny homes and um, new ways of doing things like our, our Emerald Ash Borer management and finding new ways to finance that. I know all of us are hearing from constituents just about the devastating effect of losing trees and then having to wait two or three years or longer to have them replaced. Um, so taking on those kinds of issues. And then I'm also really excited about some of the longer term things like the street maintenance investments that we've been talking about for a long time that we are tackling now. Um, and and finally, and, and you know, th these don't always rise to a policy session necessarily, but we baked in a lot of ongoing updates on topics that may not be new, but are things that we care about. So not all of our priorities are brand new things. Affordable housing, for example, um, is something that we've done a lot of work on with our housing trust fund. And I think having those quarterly updates on the trust fund on how many units we're creating, I mean, those kinds of updates are really helpful even if they're not new work and that's baked into the plan um, as well. And we've also asked for updates on all of the resolutions and all the ordinances that we passed at one time where we said we want to check back in on this. So I know our short term rentals, our ADUs are supposed to come back to us for a report. Um, I'm really glad we're having that accountability to say, what did we ask for? And, and this year we're going to get it. So just really, really love the way this is coming together. Great. Other thoughts? Great. All right, well, oh, Ms. Prince. Oops, you might be muted. <laughs> <laughs> this may not be exactly on point, but um, when we're talking about regular updates, I, I attended the BRC meeting this morning, Business Review Council this morning, because I saw that the mayor and the Citizens League Commission, we're gonna be reporting on that commission's work. And um, one thing that came up there was that they were getting very little public input through their, um, through their you know, online forms and call in number and so on and so on. I think, I think, we, I think we should get a similar update and that may not be an org committee um, agenda that I think would, probably be our 3.30 agenda because most people watch that. But I, I do think it's important that we hear from them because it's about halfway through the process now and, um, and I, it would be good to know what kind of inputs they have gotten and what they still need. And Ms. Prince, I... Um... Thank you for that. I know Ms. Houston was also at that meeting, and I one of the um, Ms. Jalali is um is our council representative on the um, the commission, and so one of I I agree that we need a formal report from you know Mr. Yang and the mayor's office, um, but as well I um, expected that Ms. Jalali will have or okay. updates at our, our committee as well. Sure. Um, so I mean. If not, we what the heck are we on the commission for? Um, and and if those are challenges that they're facing, we should we do need to know about them. So hopefully, um, this uh, infrastructure will help um, with those reports as well. But I think um, Ms. Houston said we got to make sure we get this report, and it sounds like it's going to be sooner than we thought. So um, she's on that as well. But thank you, and I'm you're very committed to that BRC. So I want to just give you a hat tip for that. I always <laughs> intend to go. And then instead, I don't. So, <laughs> so thanks for that report. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So that's where we're at. And at our next org committee meeting, folks will all have had a chance to look at the um, work plan. And again, it's just a living document. We can change it and modify it along the way. But the intention is to really clarify what our policy positions are um, in advance of the budget 
um, so that we can um, have a, a budget conversation that includes our priorities um, and answer the questions <laughs> that we that puzzle us. So, um, all right. So we are going to shift gears. Um, I am. I see um, Mr. Provratsky is on the line. Um, Matt, can you just let us know that we can hear you? Yep. Can folks okay. hear me? Yep. There you are. So um, Ms. Jalali is um, not has not joined us yet, but um, Matt is going to give us an update on the COP um, program RFP that just went out um, in her place. So I'll turn things over to you, Mr. Provatsky. All right, thanks, Council President. Thanks, Council Members. Um, first, I'll say too, a lot of the input that Council Members provided was really helpful in making sure the final product we had represented sort of the council goals that have been expressed over the last couple of years. So I just want to make sure I thank folks for getting that feedback back to our office because that fed directly into the finished product we got out. Um, and so far, we already have one applicant, which I think is pretty amazing considering it's a pretty substantial thing to pull together in such short time. Um, and we've had several calls and emails into the office. FISA in, in the Ward 4 office is fielding a lot of those initial questions. Most of them are from folks who are interested in seeing sort of the complete list of questions before they click into the application portal, which I think is fairly understandable. And considering if someone clicks through, they can see them ahead of time anyway. We've been sharing those questions as people request them. And I think um, for efficiency, I'll send those around to all council offices today just in case you get those direct questions as well. Um, so those those have been most of the questions, but I think based on the number of inquiries into um, asking for clarification and some basic assistance, we should expect a number of applications. Um, knowing that, I we would be really happy to see council offices sharing it even more. We have basically a week still of application window. So if folks want to share in their social media channels or um, you know through their networks or even sharing directly with organizations they know who want to be doing this work, that's great. I'll make sure I re-up that sort of draft um, social media content in folks' email inboxes if they want to amplify. We already got some good some good coverage in the Pioneer Press as well as on TV and in KSTP. Um, so it's it's been a good response so far, and I think that's because council members have really been talking about this for for a while and shown it as a priority. So I think it's it's going well so far. Great, Matt. Can you just remind us of the timeline? Yep. The um, so the application deadline is for the is for the tenth, so a week from today, and then following that, there's about a week built in, or a little more than a week built in, for internal review of all those applications. And I think that draft scorecard was sent around to council members for from some initial feedback. And following that, I think the council is expected to approve um, the initial slate of, of selections on February 24th. And so uh, following that process, if any of the selected um, winners are not yet uh, city contractors and not yet into that official system, then we will help sort of work with HERO and get them into that official stpaulbids.com you know, contracting system so they can officially be vendors and get that reimbursement. And I should say too, there's been a lot of legwork done by by Holly and Nia and other council staff to make sure we're sort of and Rachel in the in the city attorney's office to make sure we're up to snuff on the on that operational side too. Great, thank you. And and um, I just want to lift up the the efforts that were made by um, FISA, you, um, Hua Zhang, and and like to your point, all council offices who gave input. Um, we tried. Really, we tried to recognize what are the barriers for participation for folks that are not the usual suspects, as they say, when it comes time to apply for um, programs at the the city. Whether it's um, you know we don't I don't have insurance I don't have um, I'm not on the bid list I don't know how to do this process and really kind of try to strip it down to the bare essence of what we were looking for, with a clear intention to um, get the best proposals in and then help shepherd people through the rest of the process on the back end. Um, I know Public Arts St. Paul is really committed to doing a similar process because they had, you know, really limits on who would apply for public art projects because um, folks who knew the system. Could get in and get the, the the projects, and folks who didn't were missing out. So, I mean, this is another level of um, ensuring that we are um, uh, providing an equal opportunity for people, for organizations to apply. And you know, we may learn that um, 
the the need is much I mean, we know the need is bigger than a, a hundred thousand, which is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. Um, but also we may find organizations we didn't even know that they were out there doing work. So I think this is going to be a win um, just from the simple uh, process that we've created that allow um, new newcomers into the game. So I really appreciate those extra efforts and the translation services and, and so on. So thank you so much for that. And, um, and uh, and to that point, Council President, I'll only quickly make sure I give credit to the legwork done by the Ward 1 office to encourage that upfront translation and and done by legislative aide Mai Chang, who, uh, who did a lot of legwork on the application in our previous effort to get this up and running. And so I want to make sure I specifically give them some shout out. We did want to make sure we had those translated services up front, as you mentioned, which I think is unique um, compared to other um, city processes. So that, that did take some extra effort, but I think it really showed our commitment to expanding that access. Yeah, that is that is absolutely true. The Ward 1 has been, they have been on this um, from really from day one. This is also another example of, um, you know, our, our goal last year was to get this out. Um, and it just because of all of the things that came into play, we were not able to do that, even though the commitment was really to get it out before school was out, even though school actually got out in March last year. Um, but this extra work and effort, I think, is um, probably worth the extra time. So it is um, appreciated. And again, it, it took all all hands on deck. I don't think there was a single um, council office that didn't participate in improving this process along the way. So um, thank you for that. Um, and Ms. Prince. Yeah, um, thanks, Council President. I and Matt, thanks, thanks to you and everyone else who put in um, so much time on this and on the and on the guidelines. And I appreciated being able to contribute to that um, ideas to that effort. Um, you know, one of my concerns had been that with the grants being from twenty to forty thousand dollars, as as you just said, Council President Brenmon, um, it means that if we do get a large number of applications, we are going to have a relatively small group of people actually getting the money. Um, given that it's violence prevention and violence intervention, I'm thinking that we may have some opportunity to seek some maybe private or philanthropic funds if if indeed we get a large pool of highly qualified applications. So it's premature for me to speak to that, but it's something I'd like us to be able to consider as, as we see the applications come in. That's great. And the other, um, you know, this COP fund is our council money. And so um, we, that may be a great idea for this year, but it also could be a great idea for going forward, um, like a one-to-one -one match with a foundation where all of a sudden we have 200 instead of 100, or we increase our contribution as well. So I do think that we're, I mean, this um, similar to our work plan, this is a work in progress. We've, we're inventing this as we go. And I know that, um, we have very limited amount of resources that we have this sort of flexibility around, and there's still a ton of rules um, for how it's spent. Um, so we'll be watching this, and if it if it's effective, that'll be great. But I think we also need to be prepared to recognize that it's not. I mean, it's a reimbursement program, which is very challenging for organizations. And um, so I think we need to be honest with ourselves if, if ultimately this is so much work for organizations that there's a better you know route um, to change course and, and look at other options. So I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying... Um, we've had we've had our challenges spending city money, so just want to acknowledge that we'll be looking for the good, the bad, and the ugly um, as we go through this process. Uh, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, I just want to say, um, I, I, and as I've communicated to Councilmember Jalali, I, I agree with the direction of this, particularly for this year, and I think you guys have done a lot of work, and I appreciate rolling up your sleeves and putting together a process that, um, you know, will be transparent and also focus on a shared council priority. The one thing I do just want to mention here, and I'm not trying to propose anything to change this year's, but just for future, um, and I've mentioned this to the Ward 4 office as well, um, the COP money was one of the few sources that helped fund um, programs in the special needs community in St. Paul that I found available, um, Highland Friendship Club and um, other, other things like that. The flexible dollars were able to be used for that. Um, my, the Ward 3 office a lot of times use COP money for, for those programming things. And, and it, even though it's called Highland Friendship Club, I think everybody on here 
well know is that it's it's not only Saint, Saint Paul, across St. Paul, but it's also across the entire metro area program programming. Um, but in, in future years, I think um, carving out some sort of um, part of this application for those groups, I think would be important because I know I've been working with um, some folks in this in the um, special needs community to try and find funding for different programming. And it's really hard with the dollars that we have as a city right now because most of them are bricks and mortar specific. And this was one of the ones that didn't necess necessitate that. So I just wanna put that flag or marker out there for future conversations that we should um, not forget about this fund for those needs as well. So, um, but otherwise I, I do think it, it really um, is trying to focus and address on a problem that is very present in our community right now. So I, I appreciate the directions of God. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tao. Thank you, Council President. Um, I think that one thing that we should consider with this COP program is to, to give, um, because it is a reimbursement, um, we could give like 20% or maybe even 40% uh, upfront. And so, and then the rest could be reimbursement. So that some of these organizations have some cash up front. And I see this model work at Ramsey County. Um, and it seemed maybe to help some of the smaller organization uh, get things going. And so uh, hopefully that's something that we, we would consider. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for bringing that up. And I don't know what the the rules are. One of the one of the ideas that I've tried to float a few times is the idea of like a like an escrow account, where there the money is put into a like kind of a third party account, but that you could just quickly draw it down as you um, made your expenditures. Because I think one of the challenges is it's not just reimbursement; it's slow reimbursement. Um, mm -hmm. And so that requires that the organization has a little bit of ability to float the their expense, expenses. And um, mm -hmm. I think we as a city need to get with the program. And I mean, once you've used Venmo once, um, you realize that there's other ways of distributing money um, that are quicker and safer. You know, they're protected. But um you know, waiting for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or even five weeks to get a check for something that you spent money on is, you know, uh, can really be a barrier for organizations. So um, I don't know if we're allowed to give money, a certain amount of money up front, um, but I think we should explore that. And I also think we should figure out other ways where we can put money in like a an intermediate holding space where um, they, the the clunky bureaucracy doesn't slow down the reimbursement process, recognizing that it's problematic to just give forty thousand dollars to an organization that says they're going to do something, and you know, just from an accountability side. Um, but how do we find that middle ground? And so I appreciate you bringing that up because I know we have had star money um, committed that went unspent because organizations simply couldn't afford to float the money. So I appreciate that, and and um, we'll follow up on that. Um, Ms. Yang. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, for your quick briefing. I'm really excited about the RFP and we're um, in our office. We're totally committed to reaching out and, and telling folks about it, especially groups um, in Ward 6. And I may have missed this, but can you um, share, like, is it the council that will be taking a look at all the applications and selecting who to fund or is it a, is it a, a committee that will be doing that? Yep. The review team will be made up of some council staff. Um, so, uh, Hua Zhang from the Ward 5 office, who's who's been working on this, you know, for a long time, as well as Mai Chong, who's been from Ward 1, who's been working uh, for a while. FISA from our office will just help coordinate and run that process as well. So she'll be on that review team, but they'll be joined by other folks to make sure they're sort of across a cross-sectional representation. So Daniel Yang, who's been leading public safety for um, at least the past year from the mayor's office, as well as um, Danny Givens' office at the county and, and uh, as well as our city work level. Um, and then Joel Franklin as an existing partner. That was a suggestion made by Ward 1, which I thought was really apt of they've gone through the process of sort of building a program and proving it and, and growing it from concept on. Um, so that's, that's sort of the cross section of folks. And I think um, to council member uh, Prince and Tolbert's points about sort of um, first to council member Prince of that note from 
it had been written to allow for grants of up to forty thousand dollars, but the phrasing um, originally almost suggested that forty thousand was the default, and we did tweak that so that the default is more about twenty thousand to encourage a greater number of organizations. And I thought that was a great suggestion, especially because I think, as as Council President Brenmoen noted, it gives us more chance chance individual chances to prove the concept because as she mentioned there's a lot of variability in starting a new program and proving it through metrics and and valuation and outcomes and so i think having more individual organizations or theoretically having more will also give us a way as council member tolbert said that once once we are able to prove some of those those concepts and those programs then if they can be more of a programmatic investment maybe some of these previously used cop dollars can go back to some of those engagement efforts that council offices like to so i think i think there is a way where um sort of the 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 thin road that we could tow i think theoretically all those things could align if we end up having a, a good outcome and and ultimately the council will vote on the recommendations and if there's some you know dispute about one or the other the council does have ultimate say on that and um Matt, I apologize if I'm reiterating something that you just said, but um, you know, ultimately the kind of granting that the COP program is is not an ideal funding source for organizations. Um, trying to chase down twenty thousand dollars every year is just not a sustainable way to raise money. So this is a good. I think this is a good way to test a theory, to to test a program, um, and maybe it's a one or two year. Um, you know commitment with some of these organizations, but then ultimately we have to decide, is this part of our community first public safety infrastructure? Do we want to make this you know, ongoing funding or is this something where now that we've given this organization kind of you know, a, pla a platform or some sources to get their program up and running, are they able to sustain themselves through work um, with the county or with the state or with other granting organizations? So I, I think that one of the things we try to get away with or get away from, sorry, with the cop money is that it it the 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 amount of administration for us to distribute tiny grants and for the organizations to get tiny grants was really ending up kind of being a wash. Um, and that it it isn't we're not a granting organization. This isn't what we do. And so I, I think like again, um, Mr. Tolbert pointed out, and I think I've heard other people say this morning, this is the year to do this. We've made a commitment to do it. And then, but ultimately, um, it's also an opportunity to figure out which are the things that need to have ongoing funding. And you know, we do have a commitment to, for example, the community ambassadors. Is there some other organization that should also be part of our um, the real the fund the budget funded. Um, infrastructure for community first public safety. And, and you know, when, when we talk about shifting funding, funding from our police department to, you know, first responders with different skill sets, you know, this could be where those resources get allocated. So we're kind of, we're creating like a, an opportunity to test out some of these um, organizations and their ability to deliver. Um, so, okay, I'm looking to see if there's other thoughts and comments on this topic. And um, I think everyone heard Matt say it is a quick timeline. I think we recognize that like, if we give folks 12 weeks to respond, they'll take 12 weeks to respond. And if we give them two weeks, they'll take two weeks. And we've already got one in the door. So it proves the point a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. But the commitment really is there to get these bonds out and into the community and not be sitting on them at the end of the year. So, um, okay, so we have one more topic, but it's a kind of a big one. Update on committees, boards, and activities. So I'll just look to council members for hands up if, if uh, people want to ch um, ch chime in on just their own, um, their commitments um, on boards, commissions, and um, committees. I, I will just start by sharing quickly that I serve on the League of Minnesota Cities, um, and I've, I've shared um, uh, some items that, I, that have come through the, the board meeting with the whole council just because I thought that they were interesting and timely. Um, but just wanted to reiterate again that um, over, I think with the shifts in population, I'm hearing more and more small cities and medium-sized cities having the same challenges as big cities and the same challenges with the state legislatures as big cities in terms of needing more support from the state 
for to be able to do our primary functions, um, especially given the kind of the new challenges with trying to levy um, sales taxes. And across the state, um, cities are looking to sales taxes as ways to create revenue um, for their own cities because they're struggling just to pay for basic infrastructure needs, just like we are. Um, and uh, other thing I will just mention that I found interesting was um, some of the the large the city large cities and counties in rural Minnesota. Um, were saying that they felt it was it was interesting that um, there were so many barriers for them to create uh, sales tax in their cities, but that the counties that they were in could um, levy a transportation tax, and that they were frustrated because the county was using really money that was generated in their big city. And I'll put the quotes up, but you know, Bemidji's a big city, um, and it's a wonderful city, but. Um, that you know, some frustration that those monies were rolled out to the part of the greater part of the county and not just in the city. And it was a good opportunity to be like, we know how that feels <laughs> here in St. Paul, um, not with Ramsey County, but the state in general. And um, but it, I do think it is interesting how it's creating some a lot more alignment and synergies between the big cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, St. Cloud, Bloomington, Rochester, and smaller cities across the um, entire state of Minnesota. Um, their legislative agenda is very strong this year. It has a very strong uh, focus on equity. Um, and I will just remind people, it's early right now. I will remind again an upcoming org committee, but they do have um, legislative committees that meet throughout the summer um, to identify what the following year's legislative priorities will be. And that is where the sausage grinding happens. And um, if council members can participate in any of those committees, they are of specific interest. I think it's a great opportunity to learn um, about how things work at the legislature and just generally um, how policies are developed. But also, um, if you cannot participate, it's a great thing to send legislative aides to. Um, they have a they work with other leaders across the state and at the state legislature to identify these policies. Um, they learn a lot and then also get that exposure and um, build their networks. And so it's been a, it's a great thing. I will bring it up again when it's we're closer to that time. But again, you know, what do they say if you're not at the not on the not at the table, you're on the menu? I can't remember the saying, but we need to be there. I'm mean, gonna represent the big cities because we are um, a large city. We have a large voice, but we're one city, and and there's a, so like hundreds and hundreds of cities across the state of Minnesota. So, um, if we're not there representing our own challenges and our own perspective, and in a lot of ways we're kind of ahead of the curve for the challenges that the smaller cities will be facing, um, we miss out. So I mean, we'll encourage people to participate in that. I've done it a few times, and it was great, great use of time. All right, so I'm looking to see my colleagues if anyone has other committee commission reports. Ms. Yang. Yes, I, I'm VP on the St. Paul Regional Water Services Board. And so I wanted to let you all know tomorrow morning we are conducting a round of interviews for our general manager, Steve Schneider, who's been with the city for a really long time, is retiring. It's a lot of really great news around retirements uh, this year, last year. I'm really excited for folks. <laughs> um, and so if you have worked with him in the past, definitely encourage you all to send him, um, you know, really kind and encouraging words uh, as we uh, get closer to hiring. And so that's really exciting. And then this is more related to Hillcrest. I did reach out to Bill Dermody to offer all of you a briefing on where we are at with Hillcrest. We've made a lot of progress. We've narrowed down layouts for Hillcrest to two layouts now, which will be presented, the, presented to the public very soon. And so if you are interested in hearing more about that, I definitely um, encourage you to take up the, the briefing with Bill. Ms. Yang, do you would you recommend that we invited um, Bill to just do a quick report at the council meeting, or do you think it's better to just do one-on-one -on -one meetings because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of info. Um, so I I was thinking a one-on-one -on -one meeting in case you all had questions. But if you are interested in having a, a larger like group presentation, we can definitely ask him to come too. So I, let it, let me know what you think. Yeah, I, well, maybe I'll take the briefing. I think it's the question is always like, when's the right time? Like, I think we always like, is it too early or too late in the process? And it sounds like this may be like kind of a point before a point where it would be good to have like a public check in. Um, but maybe and maybe we can chat about it a little bit offline. Like I don't sure. so, sometimes it is nice to be able to people have different um 
lines of questioning and and sometimes that's good to do in a group setting but sometimes it's too early and it ends up just being kind of thanks <laughs> you know so yeah. we'll figure it out okay. okay sounds good great did you have other reports nope that's all okay awesome thank you um ms naker Thanks, Council President. I was just thinking that um, one of the wonderful things about our council is how collaborative we are and how many of the things that I noted down to report on I'm um, working on in collaboration with or on the same committee as uh, other people on the council. So um, I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes with any of these. I'm going to let um, my awesome co-chair, Councilmember Prince, talk about the audit committee, um, which we're both which we're both working very hard on. But um, I will update on the St. Paul Children's Collaborative that I sit on the board of. Um, exciting to see them starting to take more of a role. They really want to move into the advocacy space and advocate more for out of school time and early childhood education at the legislature. Um, they are also part of our uh, St. Paul 3K leadership group, which met for the first time um, Monday and had about 40 community leaders all excited about the idea of more of a city role in um, child care. So that was exciting. I'm also on the Riverview Policy Advisory Committee with Councilmember Tolbert, and um, we had a great meeting with uh, Ramsey County staff and um, with Russ Stark, who's also on the policy advisory committee with us to try to um, diversify the folks who are on that committee. And so we're gonna take a little more time to try to put out the word more more broadly. Um, so if you know people who wanna serve on the Riverview Policy Advisory Committee, especially if they live along the West 7th Corridor, um, there is still time to apply for that. And then finally, had a great meeting with Councilmember Prince and Councilmember Tao's office. Um, and PED Public Works and DSI on our Open for Business initiative. And we are sort of revamping that and excited to learn from COVID, take some innovative ideas for how we've been able to be flexible in responding to business needs over the last year, and hopefully move into doing more of that kind of um, open for business work in the year ahead. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Prince. Oops, you might be muted. Thank you, Council President Brenmo, and and thank you, Council Member Naker, for the for the introduction on the audit committee. Um, as you all know, we adopted a resolution late last year to have the audit, our first audit be of our customer service work, um, our customer service response, how people get information from the city, and. Um, then we discovered that the OTC investment in um, a similar area, including the development of the new um, website, was kind of overlapping with our plans. So we spent some time um, carving out the role for the audit. And the great news is that the um, RFP has gone out and for um, consultants who will perform that audit with our committee um, adv advising. And we will be having that meeting, I believe, later this month to look at those proposals and and make a decision. So um, thanks so much to Council Member Tao, Council Member Yang, and um, Co-Chair Naker, because I feel like we have stayed on a really good schedule. We're moving along. Our community advisors are working out just as we hoped, providing great input. And um, and also it's just been terrific to work with um, the administration. Um, John McCarthy is an advisor to our committee as is Matt Larson from Innovations. And the process of working with OTC on this all went pretty smoothly. So, so we're excited about it. Um, although my next item is is a little bit more involved, so I don't know if we want me to report now on reparations with Ms. Mormon, or do we want to save that until people have made their um, additional reports? I'll, I, I, I think Ms. Mormon's here, and I think go right ahead. It's very timely, and it's a good time for that update. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I just want to thank all of you um, for for your sponsorship of this important reparations work that that we are going to be taking on, and it is a big, ambitious, undefined effort. And so I am so grateful to Ms. Maloney um, contacting 
my office right away and saying, okay, what are the next steps? And assigning uh, Ms. Mormon to that task to work with the council on a schedule and a work plan for getting the legislative advisory committee appointed later this year. Um, I have a few other comments about the role of the steering committee, but I think for purposes of um, this presentation, I think the next the next point would be if Ms. Mormon could just put that um, document up in front of us and just walk us through it briefly. Welcome, Ms. Mormon. Good morning, council members. Um, can you see me? My camera here doesn't show if you can or not. So I see a dark yeah. square. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm seeing too. Um, can Is you it see pointing away from you by any chance? No, it's. Um, all right, um, I'm going to try to share my screen uh, and let me know if that actually works. Otherwise, I probably need to come back in. Um, there you go. Perfect, okay. So um, when looking at this, I wanted to be super clear that what we're dealing with is a very long-term project for the city. And we um, Ms. are- Ms. Yeah. Ms. Mormon, I can see your screen, but it, right now it just has the um, uh, chat section from Teams up. It doesn't have the document. <sighs> okay. Let's try that again. My apologies there. Teams is not working right for me this morning, I guess. Um, I mean, it's good news. It was a good report on the chat. Nothing embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. There you um, go. My apologies for that. Uh, okay. So what I'm trying to put together just up front, and, and I'll give it to you in broad brushstrokes and then get into some detail here, is um, the council will be putting together a legislative advisory committee, and we are in phase one. We are preparing to establish that legislative advisory committee. In the resolution the council adopted early in January, you gave yourself six months to do that. So um, my goal is to help the council get the advisory committee put together a resolution through council establishing it confirming its charge its membership and so on um, phase two of the work would be the legislative advisory committee um, going through its process as you know the legislative advisory committees have a maximum of one year that they can meet uh, so i did put this in for an entire year for the work to be happening um, Phase three would be when the report comes back from the advisory committee to the city council. You can see that this is projected to be um, happening. It, I'm thinking the presentation would be late June, and then the council would consider the report uh, July through November. I'm giving it that kind of timeline because I imagine that you will be looking at ordinance drafts, working with the city attorney's office. There'll be revisions. That includes public hearing time and um, also the time from adoption of any ordinance and its publication to actually being effective. So um, the further out in the future we go, the um, less predictable the timeline is obviously, but I just wanted to throw some parameters around so you could envision what this would look like. Phase four would be um, the mayor actually making appointments to this commission and the council would then be um, confirming those and um, perhaps optimistically, but hopefully um, the commission being seated and beginning its work in January of 2023. To get into the nitty gritty of where we are at, um, this is the month of January and the council has established or passed the resolution and staff are assigned. So we've got, we've, ch we've checked off those boxes. In February, there's quite a bit of work to be done. Um, right now, um, I'm ticking off item number one, isn't that, is providing an organizational committee update. Uh, one of the goals 
um, that Council Member Prince and I discussed and integrated in here is to identify a total of three council members to be involved. And the goal is that, you know, there's going to be items and decisions that need to be made along the way and um, getting a variety of inputs is going to be super helpful in making sure that it is um, useful and um, Honestly, when I think about this process, I think about the council right now in this six months, building a space for the conversation of the Legislative Advisory Committee to happen. And building that space, um, I, I think will require the advice of several council members. And um, what the next item is on the list is to begin networking to identify community co-chairs. Uh, the the co-chairs um i would um i've talked with council member prince and, and the thinking is that there are at least two people you know out there in the community who would be fantastic and it likely education the faith community or other community leaders you know who have credibility in this area and have good leadership facilitation skills the thinking of involving the co-chairs in early is that they can provide meaningful advice to the council while you develop applications review applications confirm the charge to the group and so on so that that is a more deliberate considered process with good advice and counsel from the community as you proceed seed. Uh, the early on, I think that um, the council will also be identifying characteristics of the people who you imagine would be on the group um, in that, you know, personal and professional backgrounds that would really lend themselves to having uh, meaningful um, work happen um, during that year. In the month of March, um, a lot of outreach is envisioned to happen. And I know that some is already happening and that Council Member Prince is meeting with people. And this is just critical uh, in, in the construct of the committee uh, that, that community members, community organizations are aware of what's going on and can begin considering how they want to approach this process, you know, suggest to members that some of them may apply to be a part of it, that that is out there and being discussed. Um, during the month of March, also developing um, an application form. I don't think that, that needs to be very involved. I think this is, you know, pretty straightforward, um, simple. And then come April um, to post that application and envisioning that that would be posted for a longish period of time, three to four weeks, so that um, there's plenty of time for people to um, apply and to think about it. And that, again, recruitment efforts, you know, of um, community members to community members and so on can happen and that it's not rushed through that it is a considered deliberate process for people's decision making about their own lives and what they can commit to um, this project and um, this year. Uh, in May of 21, I envision that that is when you would be reviewing the applications and developing a slate for council consideration as a whole, as well as, you know, um, getting comments on the draft slate. Uh, again, I would see that that kind of a discussion would happen with uh, several council members, the co-chairs, and with an assist from the mayor's office staff who are assigned to work with the committee, as well as council staff who are assigned. Uh, then in June, um, the hope would be, and this was a great suggestion that um, Council Member Prince brought forward, and that is that the committee could be established right before Juneteenth, that that is just excellent timing. Um, it is within that six month window that the council was looking for things to happen. Uh, that would mean that um, June 1st, you would really need to have your committee members, you know, confirmed and locked in um, a final draft resolution for the uh, city attorney's office to look at. And then um, adoption of the resolution no later than June 16th. Uh, finally, in this first phase, um, the 
I believe that having the co-chairs meet with staff, um, it would be really helpful for the work of the group to have an initial work plan in, in broad brushstrokes to bring to the membership of the group the following month, you know, so that there's something to begin to respond to. Similarly, that the co-chairs would um, establish a meeting schedule that could be reacted to by the membership as a whole so that um, the committee isn't spending its first meeting um, grinding out, you know, is does Tuesday work? Do we need the third Thursday and so on, that there's something that people have in front of them at that time to be able to deal with. Uh, if you like, I can go further in just a little bit. And that is when the Legislative Advisory Committee begins would be um, the first meeting would be in July. Um, in August, they would affirm a work plan and schedule. And then September through April, they would be executing that work plan that was agreed upon. Finally, in May, um, no later than May, certainly, there would be a draft report that would be put in front of the committee for their further discussion, for amending it, for reviewing it, anything that they think that needs to be done. I would think that the committee would want one or two meetings at least to, to kind of walk through what is it that they want to report out from what they've learned in this process. So um, that is, I think, as far as I need to go at this juncture in briefing. And um, do I'm, I'm wondering if there's any questions, if there's anything else that I can um, share with you that might be useful. Um, Council President Brenmo, you appear to be muted. Oh, thank you. Mr. Tao, did you have a question or is that just for your report next? I, okay. So um, I would, can I just say, Marsha, how much I appreciate that timeline that you laid out for us? Um, you know, I think when we, we um, pass this resolution, you know, people are like, great, what are the results? <laughs> and um, this is a very complicated, um, very important conversation. And the timeline that you just walked through really shows the the amount of um, you know work that will need to transpire over the course of um, this uh, steering committee's uh, tenure, and then as well as the the ultimately the commission that will be uh, appointed. So I appreciate that, and I I think you know just this. Um, the structure we have in place that we discussed earlier the, with the org committee is a great opportunity for us to get regular updates and check-ins on this process um, along the way. Um, as clearly it, it is, um, we're just at the very early beginning stages. So I thank you and I thank you for um, your work uh, with Ms. Prince to get this thing off the ground in an orderly way. I wanna make sure, as I said to Ms. Prince, like it's important and it's really important that we do it right. And this gives me a lot of um, comfort that we're off on the right foot. Um, Ms. Prince. Yeah, and I'll just um, finish up with a couple of additional comments. One is I, I welcome um, at, at least, I guess two of my colleagues is what we're allowed to do on this um, to get to work with me, you know, from from day one to um, to carry this forward. So I open that invitation up to to each of you. Um, secondly, um, the steering committee, as the St. Paul Recovery Act and Reparations Steering Committee, who drafted this resolution and and brought it forward to us obviously would like to continue to be advising our effort. And in a meeting that we had yesterday, what they are looking at doing now that is really critical to this effort is um, carving out their role as community coalition building on this, reaching out to the black churches, the African-American um, community organizations, um, to the to academia where there might be support to to pull together the people that um, will form a really important group of potential applicants to the legislative advisory committee as well as a lot of the ideas that should be considered as this moves forward there was an excellent story on care 11 the other night that provided some oh god sorry about that some historical 
context for, um, I am sorry, you guys. <laughs> Car just drove up in the driveway, so. It's life, no worries. <laughs> Council President, in the meantime, I can um, put into the chat uh, a link to the story on CARE 11. Oh, thanks, Marcia. And, and the story provided some great historical context. Um, Trier and Cruz spoke to this effort, but what we, um, the, a person we've connected with is, the, is Dr. Uhuru Williams, who runs the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas, who had some great comments in that story. I reached out to him um, yesterday and heard back from him today. He would very much like to be involved. He spoke so meaningfully to um, how important it is that St. Paul is willing to explore reparations. He also provided in the story the examples of um, Evanston, Illinois, and Asheville, North Carolina, to give people a sense of what cities can actually do. The only other thing I want to mention is that um, I know that you're, as a result of that story, that your offices are probably getting questions about what do we mean by reparations? Are we talking about payments? Um, Marsha and I are, Ms. Mormon and I right now are working on uh, frequently asked questions document to share with your offices and hopefully we'll have that to you very soon. On the issue of payments, what I need to say is um, nothing can be off the table at this point. This is really something that we need to be listening to the African American community and, and, and having them lead us in this exploration. Um, that said, I think that it's fair to say that um, if we look at the examples of other cities, that those are ones that we are would be considering um, following and establishing. There's obviously no revenue source for this, for whatever we're going to do. So this is a very open-ended issue, and I would just urge people um, to, to present it that way. It's an ex exploration of a very important way of repairing um, racial injustice. And we will be um, looking at the full range of possibilities as we go forward. So if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Please let me know if you or your um, legislative aides would like to be involved in an on, on an ongoing basis. And, um, and thanks again so much for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Prince. Are there any questions about the um, reparations initiative? Okay. All right, thank you very much for, for the report. Uh, Mr. Tao. Thank you, Council President. Um, I know that Council Member Yang touched on this earlier, uh, but I'm going to report on the uh, one of my roles to be on the St. Paul Port Authority uh, with uh, Council Member Jalali, and um, we talk about the Hill Crest. And so, from the from a port uh, standpoint, uh, we've been working closely with uh, PD on the master plan, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But we're we're really looking forward to getting that done. Um, and working very closely with PD, you know, that's going to be a lot of exciting stuff. Um, and I think that with the with the port site has really laid out a path on how to get things done. And and so you know I'm very confident that in the next couple of years we'll um, we'll start having development there as well. Um, the port's also facilitating a lot of uh, developer and, and playing matchmaking with um, uh, other uh, developer business using the PACE program. It's a, uh, a property access a clean energy program uh, that we work um, with. Right now, we're in about 45 county in the state of Minnesota working, and we're going to continue to fo focus on that going into 2021. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's happening at the um, Treasure Island Center. So many of you probably already know um, there's three fitness centers 
there. And then the St. Paul Port Authority is also relocating our office into that space. Um, restaurants there are operating at 50 percent. And um, we have 98 uh, percent space there uh, are leased out. And so that's really exciting. Uh, we continue to do a statewide uh, green initiative. Um, and so those are some of the things that we've been doing and we want to continue to do in 2021 at the St. Paul Port Authority. Thank you so much, Mr. Tao. They've, uh, Port Authority has popped up on our agenda um, quite a bit recently. So thank you for um, your representation there and for the update. Are there other, um, oh, Mr. Tao? Did you have other reports? No. Um, okay, no one has their camera on, so I feel like I'm like a teacher at um, a high school <laughs> um, trying to guess what's going on. Okay, so let's see. So does are any other colleagues have um, reports from committees or commissions? Um, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, um, just a few that weren't covered. Um, I uh, serve on, well, I serve on many that uh, people are <laughs> covered already and they did a fantastic job of covering those. Um, I think just maybe just a few brief updates. Uh, the Workforce Investment Board has been under the direction of uh, Ling Becker has been going um, a million miles an hour in terms of, of trying to meet the challenges that citizens are facing in St. Paul and in Ramsey County. A um, lot of new innovative programs, a lot of new ideas, as well as allocating CARES money and working on the workforce centers. And I know their continued partnership with St. Paul. I think um, we will be having some update from them as one of our policy sessions, I, I'm assuming, um, this year. So that that might be a better opportunity to fully delve into it. But I will say it's, it's great um, to see the Workforce Investment Board um, and, and the workforce the people tasked with workforce going, um, working so hard to try and meet the the immense challenges is that St. Paulites are facing. Um, the Riverview uh, Planning Committee that Councilmember Naker and I both sit on continues to meet, and um, we're more in the informational stage and and study phase and engineering phase. So there's not a ton to report there in terms of actual action items, um, and. Um, Visit St. Paul, uh, uh, that board, which Councilmember Prince is on and Councilmember Naker is on, um, uh, we extended the contract of Terry Matson for two more years um, at the last board meeting. So that's probably the most noteworthy thing there. I know they are working on a huge um, restaurant initiative, both in terms of how to restaurants that are available now and then in the future um, what would safe reopening look like and, and helping, um, you know, restaurants after this. Um, if there's individual restaurants that need help or promotion in terms of that, I, I know our PD has a lot of resources, but I think sometimes we forget to send them to visit St. Paul, which is tasked with this and is actually putting resources towards it. I've sent a few restaurants there myself. Um, and uh, I, I can't recall if... Uh, well, I think that's that's about the other that's the, the update. HR, we all are on the HRA, so I don't think I need to update anybody on the HRA. <laughs> but uh, that's like my sister and I refer to when we talk about. I say my mom, and she's like, "Oh, I don't know who that is. Is that my mom?" Um, <laughs> like HRA. Um, okay. Well, and and um, Mr. Tolbert, uh, as part of the leadership team, is working um, with Holly and PED to get us updates on. Um, all the major projects that are, are happening in the city just to get a touch base on those items as well. So they're not committees, commissions, and boards, but something that we have a schedule for updates on as well. So I think that that um, is worth noting as well. Um, I'm looking to my colleagues. I, the one, uh, one thing I did not mention was I serve on St. Paul College Board um, President's Advisory Commission, and um, they're in the process of transitioning to a new um, president. Um, Dee Dee Peasley is interim president. She's doing a great job. Um, my understanding is that they'll be announcing the new president in March. Um, there has been a search committee and a process that underway. Um, I'm looking forward to kind of that next chapter starting. I 
the board has been um, receiving lots of reports and information, which is great. But I think when we get into the, the work of the board, it will be um, all that more meaningful. Um, but definitely want to remind folks, and, and as we're talking about this, like wondering if it's a good opportunity to bring in some of these um, local partners, um, com colleges, um, St. Paul College in particular is such a great um, asset and resource to St. Paul residents who can attend for free or low charge. Um, lots of career opportunities for non-traditional career paths. Um, they have surgical suites and um, you know um, some technical uh, training there that you can't get anywhere else. And um, it is they are just doing a fantastic job. And um, every time we get another update, I'm like, what they do that too? What they do that too? So they're they're great, and and we'll have to um, find a, an opportunity to bring them in and and showcase um, some of the work that they're doing. And and um, along that line, I'm one of my priorities in in this term is to um, to really try to engage our colleges and universities in St. Paul more on a uh, uh, on a more regular basis, on a troubleshooting, helping us do troubleshooting with their young, bright minds, um, and also uh, to just have them at the table in our economic development and in um, efforts. Uh, I feel like they're, they're resources that are here. They contribute to our economy. They contribute to our community. Um, and we have gone kind of away from being very um, thoughtfully engaged with them. So I'm working on some initiatives um, right now, in addition to the St. Paul College with McAllister College, um, Hamlin University, um, and Concordia. And of course, there's others as well, but you got to start someplace. Um, and so I sh hopefully will have, um, that is not a committee or a commissioner or a board, but it's something that I want folks to know um, that I'm kind of quietly working on. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have more news to report on that in the months uh, and years ahead of us. But it, it's something that I think is very important. Um, these are huge, huge assets um, that are untapped as far as I'm concerned. So just a mini update on that as well. Um, I'm looking to my colleagues if there's anything else that we need to report in this section. Um, and I don't see any hands up. So um, we are completely and entirely right on schedule. Um, and is, are there any other announcements or any other business um, before us? All right, it looks like there's not. Um, so seeing none, uh, thank you everybody. This was great as our, our committees typically are and we will be adjourned. Thank you much.